What's up guys, this is Anna Crossover, I'm back with a new episode of Red Naruto with Spider-Man with the power of Speed Force Part 5 And if you did enjoy this video, give us a like and begin my channel and like my content, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more crossover fictions Now let's begin this new video Chapter 21 The Phantom Spider clenched his fists and stared at the two underground minions with his dazzling cobalt eyes Despite the fact that they were obscured by his lenses, which gleamed brightly like two white suns the phantom spider clenched his hands and spoke to those who shot their guns at him in the voice of a vengeful spirit. So y'all like shooting people, huh? The hero spoke viciously, his voice vibrating as a result of how the metamorphosis connected with his body. His two captives stared at him in terror, lowering their guns and raising their hands over their heads in submission. Please, please don't kill us. The guards complained because they had heard reports about the phantom spider going out at night and executing everyone who committed a crime. This was obviously not true in the least. The phantom spider moved his pointer fingers slowly forward, as if pointing a rifle at the two underground members. His fingers began to glow brightly with little blue orbs of godspeed energy, reflecting blue light off their terrified eyes. I won't kill you, but I'd be lying if I said this wouldn't hurt. With his divine aura and ever vibrating voice, the hero told them. Zap the phantom spider emitted godspeed energy from his fingertips, causing two tremendous discharges to be directed toward the two goons' chests. They smashed into the wall behind them and collapsed, unconscious. The only sound they made was the thump of their bodies slamming into the wall and the ground. The sound of an alarm blaring was followed by the sound of heavy footsteps stomping outside the door a few moments later. Dozens of underground goons, each armed with a different programmable matter and new form weapon, waited behind the entrance, weapons pointing. Those who couldn't stand lined up on the spiral staircase above, pointing their rifles downward into the black abyss. The underground members could only hear the noises of their own tense breaths and heartbeats in the silence of the hideout. Each member waited behind the closed door for what seemed like an eternity. Fear. Uncertainty. Anxiety. As the silence was eventually broken, these emotions spread across the air like a virus. Tomb the sound of a beast pounding steel could be heard through the darkness, only illuminated by the rifleman's spotlights, a single fist-shaped dent in the metal door revealed only a portion of the phantom's might. Tomb a fist-shaped dent was seen protruding from the other side of the door once more, but this time, the door slid forward, releasing itself from its hinges. While the rest stood frozen in terror or false confidence, a few underground members ran, shoving past their friends to the side as they fled up the steps. Bang the door was then yanked from its hinges, slamming into a group of gunmen standing in front of it, the gunman on the spiraling staircase, frozen in horror, could do nothing but watch as a brilliant apparition emerged from the darkness. His dazzling eyes, abruptly turning upward and gazing at them, jolted a few of the gunmen out of their concentration and prompted them to open fire on the phantom. Soon, the entire gang began firing their new form blasters at the hero, holding down the triggers until their rifles ran out of charge. Click 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 they attempted to continue firing despite the fact that their new form weapons were empty. Still standing in the same location, seemingly unharmed, the glowing phantom ran up the steps, hitting and kicking each member with lightning-fast assaults that were nearly invisible to human sight. The people at the top of the stairs attempted to flee, but their speed was no match for the gleaming phantom. Bang, 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 help! Please assist us, please! The underground fighters' voices could be heard slamming on the door at the top of the stairs leading into the main section of the stronghold. Standing at their stations, the people on the other side watched in horror as their friends continued to smash their fists on the metal door and plead for aid. Soon, their calls for aid turned into anguished screams, and the opposite side of the door fell silent. Holy fuck, dude. One of the gunmen spoke to the man next to him. We're all going to fucking die. Hold your ground. He can't take on all of us. One of the gunmen proclaimed erroneously, clearly underestimating the phantom spider's ultimate strength. Tomb the phantom punched the metal door with a godspeed punch, like he had done before, causing the gang members to brace themselves. They were terrified, terrified to death, yet they were adamant about fighting. That determination, however, would be exposed as a ruse once the ghoul on the other side of the door revealed his covered face. Tomb, here he comes, one of the members yelled, prompting them all to raise their weapons from their nests and point their trigger fingers toward the door. Bang immediately after removing the door from its hinges, a hail of bullets descended on the hero, who did not wait this time. Outrunning them, the hero charged forward toward the melee warriors, landing a powerful electric punch on a bat-wielding criminal and knocking him out instantly. The rest surrounded the hero as he stood over their buddy, 
wielding a variety of melee weapons such as bats, whips, and swords, all while new form energy blasts rain down on him. What the hell? One of the gunmen said, stopping his fire along with the other gunmen as they stared at the hero's glowing, immobile form, as if their blasts were nothing more than fine snowflakes grazing his body. Raw. One of the swordsmen yelled at the hero, swinging the hilt of a programmable matter blade that extended into a katana. The hero approached the swordsman in slow motion, peering into his soul with his cobalt eyes as he took a step forward. To the hero, he was casually strolling forward as if on a walk in the park, but in reality, he was going at a practically unfathomable speed. As the hero barely leaned to the side, he watched the sword slowly slice the air near him before kicking the swordsman in the chest. As the swordsman sped away, his blade launched into the air, losing its shape and transforming into nothing more than a clump of cubes. This was the real form of programmable matter, only adopting the form of a weapon when willed by the user while imbued with new form. The phantom spider leapt into the air and seized the flying cubes, changing them into a reverse bladed katana, with the blade facing away from the opponent to avoid killing them. The hero swung his reverse sword in a circle around him as soon as he landed, instantly deactivating all ten melee combatants around him. When the other underground members saw this, they all dropped their weapons and began to flee in terror of the spider. Because the majority of them were only teenagers who got mixed up in the wrong crowd, the hero let them flee with a parting message. Don't let me catch any of you kids doing this again. I'll find you. Most of them were terrified of the phantom spider because of his mechanical, electric voice. Phew. The hero sighed, liberating himself from his shape, which was wearing him down. It felt like he'd been in a sauna or hot shower for too long, but it was also as sore as if he'd been lifting weights at the gym for hours on end. I suppose I'll phone Yuri and inform her. One final underground member emerged from the top of her tower before he could finish his thought. Clonk the hero could hear metal banging into the ground next to him. He looked around, observing the tinkerer, the underground's commander, kneeling on the ground with an enlarged programmable matter fist on the ground. The chamber was dark, but the moonlight streaming in through the adjoining big window lit up both the hero and the underground leader. She was staring at him, and despite the fact that her face was veiled, he could sense nothing but utter hatred emanating from her. You, she yelled with venom in her voice, you took everything from me, she yelled at the hero before rising to her feet and flaunting her chrome-colored programmable matter armor that covered the majority of her body. The underground needed to end tonight, you nearly killed countless innocent people with your new form antics, the hero informed her. He was still in his base form, but he was ready to shift. He wasn't sure how, but his change had become instinctive, and he was confident that if he put his mind to it, he could do it again. I'm not interested in the underground. I only used them to have the strength to confront you. The tinkerer responded coldly, her big metal fists clenched at her side. Why? What, you thought fighting me would be fun? The hero inquired. Because. As the tinkerer spoke, her metal fist shrank to the size of a normal hand. She then removed her mask, revealing her true identity to the phantom spider. She didn't care about her identification at the time, she just wanted to make sure he understood who she was. No. Naruto murmured, instantly knowing the woman in front of him. Her devastated expression, which mirrored his on the night his mother died, jolted him to his core. Her jet black hair had been trimmed into a short bob, and her eyes had lost their radiance. She had aged since his original image of her, but he was positive it was the same person. If there was any doubt, Tinkerer's remarks would quickly dispel it. You killed my father. As she whispered those words, her voice quivered, sending Naruto into a mental spiral. The girl who appeared in his nightmares nearly every night. The girl whose father he brutally murdered the girl he saw in that photograph on that one faithful night was standing there in front of him, all grown up. She was there in front of him, looking at him with hate-filled eyes, exactly as he had done to her father, Wilson Fisk, before killing him. Those feelings that had begun to dissipate when Naruto convinced himself that he had changed, that he was no longer the same killer he had been on that night, all came flooding back into his head. Naruto Parker, the Phantom Spider, confronted the shadow that had been following him since the night his mother died. Though the room was dim, only the moonlight behind the girl illuminated it, and he was positive it was her. Her face had barely changed, with the only noticeable difference being her more adult appearance and broken gaze. She was there, all grown Upa the girl who had haunted his nightmares almost every night, the image in Fisk's office led him to believe that the girl was just a tiny kid, an elementary school girl. Unbeknownst to him, the photograph had been taken eight years before, when the girl was just ten years old. The phantom's shadow, Fisk's young adult daughter, flipped her wrist downward, 
changing the programmable matter into a short sword. Do you know how much I've longed for this day? The girl spoke in her now feeble voice, which was no longer obscured by her mosque's voice changer. She tried to keep up the act, to be tough in front of her father's killer, but she couldn't, Naruto. I'm sorry. The so-called hero spoke solemnly, unable to look at the girl because his head hung low. I understand what it's like to stop talking. You don't get anything. The girl yelled angrily as she slashed the ground with her sword. The self-proclaimed hero complied, remaining silent. He's vanished. After what you did to him, I couldn't even see his corpse. They said he was unrecognizable. Her impassioned voice quivered as she spoke, her fingers tightly grasping her chest. I had to watch people praise you every day for five months. I'm calling you a hero while ignoring the reality that you murdered my father. All because there was no evidence, but I know there were spiders in his office. The hero looked down at his wrists, which held the webs he used to murder her father. She was correct. Those webs could only belong to him. They had most certainly disintegrated by the time investigators arrived, but his men must have spotted them. So I used my father's money to start the underground. We steal technology and create weapons so that one day I can murder you. I'd call it quits after that. Tell me why you did it. What made his life so insignificant to you? The so-called hero paused for a while, still staring at the ground. He wasn't sure if this girl was aware of her father's crimes. The public was unaware, and the police were unconcerned. In fact, many of them were complicit. It would be his own daughter who would be kept in the dark about his secret. Regardless, the truth had to be revealed. The youngster opened his jaws and lifted his head gently to face the shadow that had accompanied him since that night. He killed my mother. As soon as those words left his mouth, the girl's countenance changed to bemusement. She couldn't believe it as those words hit her in the chest. Her father was a wonderful man, so the youngster had to be lying to her, he'd never take someone's life. At least, that was what she told herself. The girl shook her head, staring ahead blankly as if seeing through the boy. No, that's not true, it's true, remarked Fisk's assassin. I'm sorry you had to find out the truth about your father like this. You liar. Using her programmable matter boots, the girl took a step forward that reminded me of Naruto in his regular state. The broken girl slashed at the hero's neck with her sword, intending to kill, but his agility denied her an easy death. Despite the fact that her blow had missed her target, she proceeded to slash horizontally and vertically with her purple-lit chrome sword. Despite holding back and remaining in his regular form, the boy continued to evade since he was far too fast for her. The tinkerer drew her arm back, transforming her programmable matter weapon into a gigantic fist that virtually outgrew her entire body. The girl fired a tremendous attack while letting forth a fierce growl from within her. Her father's assassin halted the blow with both hands as he stared her in the eyes through his buggy, white glasses. The child was calm, despite the girl's distress, and he proceeded to speak as such. I was sitting at home, and I heard the police saying my name at the front door. Despite the boy's heartfelt words, the girl continued her assault. She embiggened her second fist with her programmable matter to create yet another massive, chrome fist. She unleashed yet another strong strike with every fiber of her being. The boy grasped her other fist with a single hand, never breaking eye contact with her through his mask. The boy spoke again, this time calmly. I opened it, they came inside, and they told me that my mother's body was found in a landfill. As he relived that night in his mind, the boy's disguised face got wet with tears. Despite the fact that his face was veiled, the girl was able to sense his feelings. It was as if his anguish had been transferred to her. A landfill. He spoke it again, this time plainly choking. Like garbage, he continued. I later discovered that her body had been completely dismembered and thrown into a garbage bag. We weren't even able to bury a body. As his mother's funeral replayed in his thoughts, the disguised child began to choke up and almost lost his capacity to speak. We felt that leaving her in that state was just. The child paused once more as visions of his mother's disfigured body flashed through his mind. The tinkerer had stopped hitting him by this point and had taken a few steps back, listening to him with her chrome fists lowered to normal size. Normally, ashes are not buried, but her one wish was to be buried next to my father, so that's exactly what we did. We cremated her and buried her next to my father. The girl remembered her father's burial, as the hero stated. They were almost similar, mirror reflections of one another. Both children, who were only 17 at the time, had lost their only parent, both stood there watching as the lone guardian, the only defender they had left, was carefully lowered into the earth alongside their husband, who had left the world before them. Both teenagers stayed motionless for hours, intending to exact revenge on the person who had brought them misery. 
How do you know my father was the one that did it? The tinkerer inquired, still unable to believe her father would do such a thing to another person. The boy explained, my mother was a reporter. She was aware of something awful happening in New York. I read through hundreds of files on her computer, and everything pointed to Fisk and another man I couldn't place, so I turned to your father for help. When I got there. Before continuing, the child interrupted his remembrance, gripping his hand and tensing his entire body. He let out a breath. When I got here, to this very place we're standing right now, I lost it. The boy's face was drenched in tears from beneath his mask as wrath, self-hatred, remorse, guilt, and despair began to overtake him. He began reliving his night at Fisk Tower in the same way he fought Electro and relived his mother's recollection, feeling as if he were actually there. Every little detail, every punch, every blood splash, every fractured bone, every scream. It was relived by the so-called hero. Though minutes had passed in his mind as he replayed the event, barely a second had gone by in actuality. When his consciousness returned to the present, the youngster continued to inform her about his error. Full of rage, I attacked and interrogated him, but he didn't give me the answers I needed. I was bitter, just like you are now. I killed him because I thought it would make me feel better. Those webs you discovered were mine. I assassinated Wilson Fisk. The girl's body trembled as a result of her wrath and anguish. In her mind, the hero still hadn't presented a compelling reason for killing her father. He seemed to have slain the man without any concrete proof or evidence that he was his mother's murderer. You just killed him out of rage. You have no evidence that it was him. The girl's chrome gloves began to shine once more as she formed huge fists. She was stopped in her tracks before she could even launch an attack. March 11th. The girl stopped dead in her tracks as the boy uttered this. That date meant a lot to her, but she had no idea how he knew or what it meant to him. That's your birthday, right? The boy inquired. She didn't say anything in response. The boy proceeded, knowing her birthday meant nothing to him. That was his phone's password, it is still. I saw dozens of messages, each with a photo attached. That's when I noticed my mother. What remained of her the message said, job's done, boss, as if he were working in an office and submitting his work to a boss. Where is the phone now? I'm not going to believe you until I see it for myself. The boy dug into his coat pocket and pulled out the identical cell phone he found that night. I've been using it as a burner for quite some time. I didn't want to give the officers my real phone number, so I utilized this phone's texting app. The boy held up the phone to show the girl the all too familiar device. He tossed it to her, and she recognized the unchanged lock screen right away. The phone's passcode remained the same, as the hero had told her, 0311. The hero gave her instructions as soon as the phone was unlocked. Go to the messages, you'll find it all there, he said. She scrolled through the messages, as he instructed, and discovered an endless sea of assassination confirmations. She couldn't say anything. She had previously taken everything he said with a grain of salt, but the hard evidence was right there. No, she replied. I don't know how or why you did this, but it's not true. As a trauma response, the girl continued to lie to herself, but Naruto persisted. After what he did to me, I'll never forgive your father. I don't expect you to forgive me, but this has to stop. What are you doing, killing people to get to me? I never murdered anyone. The underground just steals the equipment we require. We don't kill, she explained. To her knowledge, no one had died as a result of the underground shenanigans, but her rationale had two major flaws. You were about to murder an innocent child earlier today. A harmless child would have been killed if I hadn't played the part. He would have left me no choice. How about that office building that nearly collapsed due to the helicopter attack by your men? You nearly killed dozens of innocent people in your quest for vengeance. Was it really worth it? Was it worth taking those lives just to get to me? The tinkerer remained silent. He was correct, and she was aware of it, but she refused to admit it. She went too far, and if they hadn't met sooner, she might have broken that boundary simply to get to him. I don't want you to make the same error I did. Please, halt everything before it's too late. The spider pleaded with her. I'll stop when you're dead. I've come this far, and I've come this close. I'm not going to stop now. She was far too tenacious to give up. She knew she was in the wrong at this stage. She was well aware that she was the villain in this situation, as were they both, but it didn't matter to her. You can't kill me, Tinkerer. I can try. I don't want to have to go to war with you. I'm offering you an option. You and I both committed mistakes. I don't want you to be detained at Rikers. Naruto begged her one more time, but his pleading fell on deaf ears. I don't mind. I'm not going to stop until I get what I want. As the aura of Godspeed energy began to envelop the so-called hero, 
he took a deep breath and stood with his arms bent and fists clinched. He entered his ultimate god speed form once more before speaking to the girl in his now static-like voice. I apologize. I sincerely am, yet I am unable to provide you with what you seek. I have a city to protect, and you're getting in the way. This is your last opportunity. The tinkerer covered her entire body with programmable matter without saying anything, transforming her entire silhouette into a chrome version of herself. She had no intention of giving Upa not now, not after everything she'd been through. The tinkerer stood in a ready stance, a programmable matter greatsword in her right hand, solidifying her choice to be her father's killer. That was the end of it. The faded confrontation between the phantom spider and the shadow that had followed him since his biggest blunder. The faded struggle between Tinkerer and the Phantom wiped out her family. Maya Fisk, the Tinkerer, stood in front of her father's killer with her two gigantic chrome fists, now totally encased in her chrome, full-body programmable matter armor. Her body shook, whether from her uncontrollable rage and contempt for the so-called hero or from the blue new form energy visible rushing through her armor. Perhaps it was both, but she was aware that she didn't have much time until her body and new form bracelet failed her. Despite understanding her father wasn't the guy she previously thought he was, she was still blinded by ideas of vengeance. No, he was a decent man. This disguised assassin was deceiving her. That's what she kept telling herself. Why would she trust this man, this lad, this child who talked to her for selfish reasons? He merely wanted to avoid his well-deserved penalty. He was not truly sorry. He didn't care about Fisk or anyone else, for that matter. She looked at her father's killer, the phantom spider, who was firmly clasped in his ultimate god speed form. He looked at Maya blankly through his dazzling white glasses. He didn't want to hurt Maya, despite her aggressive impulses. He could feel his heart banging against his chest, as if it were attempting to escape, due to his shape greatly boosting his heart rate. As his mind raced with a million thoughts and emotions each second, his brain pulsated, as if it were going to burst out of his skull. Regret, pain, and self-hatred remained for the youngster. They never returned. If he took another step forward, his muscles felt as if they were engulfed in hell's flames and were about to break away from his bones. He didn't have much time in this new shape, it had only been a few minutes, but his body couldn't go on much longer. With his ever vibrating voice, he said his farewell words to the tinkerer. This is your last opportunity. Tinkerer, give this up. The murderer made every effort to persuade the girl of his innocence. She didn't mind. She wasn't hearing anything. All she cared about was finally avenging her father and breaking the cycle of misery and hatred. But it didn't stop there, it would never happen. Not in the way she expected. Killing her father's killer would just perpetuate the cycle, but her rage at the guy who murdered Fisk blinded her. Ignoring his comments, Maya Fisk, the tinkerer, rushed forward with her new form infused armor with the speed of a so-called hero, pulling her arm back in readiness to smack his head off with her huge fist. The assassin dodged with little effort, but her quickness surprised him. This speed, he thought to himself as his body ached. His mirror, his shadow that had been plaguing him for half a year, resembled him much more than he had imagined. It made sense, for God's speed was new form, albeit an organic version produced from his body. Because her armor was infused with it, she could move as quickly as he did when he wasn't in his ultimate state. Maya grunted as her punch whiffed past his face, she had put her all into it and her body hurt from the new form infused programmable matter's toll. Despite her training for this moment, she realized she couldn't keep it up for long, so she swiftly threw another blow, this time with her opposite fist. Ra. She let out a war cry as her fist narrowly missed the killer spider's face. His speed was remarkable, it was as if he could see the attack coming before it did, swerving away from where it would land when he saw it coming. You're not going to win, Tinkerer. Please put a stop to this. The killer tried to persuade her to stop yet again, but his words were meaningless. He has a lot of guts. As if he hadn't ignored her father's screams for months as he transformed the man's visage into an unrecognizable wreck. It was pitiful. His remarks enraged her even more, and she recklessly poured more numeric energy into her programmable matter armor. Shut, she threw another fist, this time faster, narrowly missing the boy's face. Her arm ached as the punch whiffed past her father's assassin, but she didn't care. Up. Another fist was delivered with another scream, almost missing her father's murderer by a few inches. As the tinkerer's fist whizzed past the spider's face, she turned her palm to face him, displaying a repulsor similar to Tony Stark's that she had built using her programmable matter. There was a bright flash, and a beam of energy erupted from her hand at a pace that even the quick spider couldn't match. As the beam impacted the killer in the face, the lenses on his mask enlarged, 
causing him to fly backward and smack into a wall behind him. As the repulsor faded, the tinkerer remained in the same location, her hand still facing the hole in the wall created by the self-proclaimed hero's body. That was the power of programmable matter, it could be used to build whatever weapon the user could think of. Despite his ability to absorb new form energy, this attack interacted with the boy's very exhausted body, giving him the sensation that he was going to burst. He reverted to his natural self while lying in the rubble, his ultimate form's blue glow gone. I can't keep going like this. If I try to keep that shape any longer, I'll kill myself. As he emerged from the dust and debris, this time without his light, he told himself. I think I can beat him. The tinkerer was certain she was causing harm to the killer, observing that he was now in a weaker state. However, it was clear that the killer had had enough of holding back. He realized he couldn't keep evading forever, especially given his lowered speed, so he struck. Fisk's killer stood in front of the girl in a flash, shocking her owing to his still outstanding speed in his standard form, before unleashing a devastating godspeed infused punch to the side of her armored body. The tremendous sound of his fist striking into her armor rang across the room. Despite the force of the punch, the tinkerer kept her balance, barely falling back a few inches in response. It was excruciatingly painful. Because of the intense discomfort, she wanted to tumble, curl into a ball, and cry, but she persevered. The spider's eyes squinted as he observed the girl's lack of reaction to his strike. The assassin stepped to the side for a brief second before delivering a hard punch to her liver, causing the sound of metal striking with his fist to resonate throughout the room. The agony nearly overtook her once more, though her father's thoughts kept her going. She flung her fist behind her, hoping to hit the wicked arachnid, but her arm made no contact as he flash stepped away to a safe distance. The murderer was exhaling heavily as the use of new forms continued to impact him. He spoke to the girl while holding his breath. You're not going to hit me again. Give up, or I'll have to pierce that armor. Hearing the devil say this only made the tinkerer scoff in amusement. You're saying this because you're fatigued. If you could break my armor, you'd have done it. Maya ran forward as she shouted her vow, punching the killer once again with her massive fist. He dodged to the side again and punched her in the torso. However, her armor again prevented most of the damage. Recognizing that doing the same thing over and over wasn't going to work, the tinkerer changed her right fist into a chrome, programmable matter greatsword the length of her entire body. When he saw the gigantic weapon appear in front of him, the spider's eyes squinted before the tinkerer swung the mighty weapon with amazing speed, heading directly for his neck. The child backed up, allowing the blade to pass close to his face, as well as the sound of the blade slashing the air. Despite its size, the tinkerer moved it as if it were weightless, swinging her sword toward her father's killer with breakneck speed. The orphaned gang leader danced with the big blade as if it were an extension of herself, releasing a flurry of devastating strokes that nearly sliced the spider assassin. Fisk's assassin realized that attacking her armor would be futile. He knew that if he didn't hold back and used his entire might, he might harm it, but he could also kill the girl, which was not an option for him. He realized he had to get rid of the armor in some way. As he dodged and wove her greatsword's lethal strikes, he spotted something, her new form bracelet, shining brightly on her dominant hand. He wasn't sure, but burning the bracelet would most certainly disarm her, allowing him to catch her without resorting to the same fate as her father. The tinkerer, frustrated, released a reckless, wide swing with her sword, leaving her open for a counterattack for only a fraction of a second. This little interval was all the killer needed to put an end to the conflict. Seeing his opportunity, the phantom spider darted beneath the blade, narrowly escaping a horizontal hit from the tinkerer's greatsword before grasping her wrist and crushing the bracelet with all of his strength. The sound of the glass bracelet shattering was quickly followed by an explosion, which sent the tinkerer flying backward as her chrome, full-body armor began to rip from her. Maya's head struck a neighboring wall without the protection of her armor, knocking her out in an instant. When she opened her eyes, she was atop Fisk Tower, webbed, and with her arms behind her back. She tried to move, but she was tied to a pipe on the roof and couldn't get free because of the strength of the webbing. The phantom spider could be seen crouched near the side of the tower, looking down at the location where Fisk's lifeless corpse lay, reminiscing about his past crimes. The boy turned around when he heard Maya groan. She could feel the lenses on his face relax as they established eye contact. You're awake. He said this as he came over to the girl and knelt in front of her. Maya looked down at her body, realizing that her armor had been fully removed, while she futilely fought to break free from her bonds once more. That programmable matter stuff is no longer there. The cops are down there, and I have to turn everything up to Yuri, the police head. 
the boy informed her. What happened? Maya inquired, scarcely able to speak due to her excruciating pain. That's my point, Naruto. You can't just walk away from a good woman because you're afraid. If I hadn't consented to let her in, I'm not sure where I'd be right now. Naruto was taken aback when he learned about Dr. Connor's past and realized how similar the two of them were. Naruto felt the same way about being a hero and not being there for Cindy as he did about being in the military and being frightened of not being there for his wife. What was the name of that girl, Cindy? She stares at you in the same way my wife did when we were younger. That's why I got so involved. You two brought back memories of those times. Connors began pouring the concoction into a syringe while speaking, peering at it intently. Ah, sorry for probing, it's your personal life. No, Dr. Connors, I believe you are correct. I feel exactly the same way you felt back then. Naruto acknowledged as he stared at the green syringe, trying to figure out what was inside. Dr. Connors set the syringe down and reached over to Naruto, laying one arm on Naruto's shoulder before offering him one more bit of advice. Everything you do is fraught with danger, it is also dangerous to do nothing. Parker, which risk will you take? Connors posed this hypothetical inquiry to him, not anticipating a genuine response from the youngster. I, Naruto started to speak, but Connors cut him off. Don't respond right now, just keep in mind what I said. All right, Dr. Connors continued, his hand remaining on the boy's shoulder. Right, Naruto said, returning his focus to the green vial. What's in there? He inquired. Just some reptilian DNA. Connors responded dismissively. Naruto was able to piece out what it was quickly. He understood it was something he was fairly obsessed with based on the number of vials and the numerous papers, books, and files littered around. He was interested in the healing properties of reptiles. I'm sorry if this seems insensitive or rude, but is it for yourself? Naruto inquired. Your arm? He went on to say. Connors gave a nod. Nothing escapes your notice, Parker, he added. Unfortunately, my 20-year investigation has yielded no results, but I'm not going down without a fight. We share so much DNA with reptiles that I am confident we can inherit their ability to regenerate. I can be whole once more. This perplexed Naruto. Connors mentioned how his wife embraced him for who he was now, but he couldn't accept himself. It was heartbreaking to see that, despite his best efforts, the man was clearly dissatisfied. His wife still loved him, but he still had some of those insecure, negative feelings from earlier. I want to help, the young man offered, but Connors was hesitant. Aren't you a little too busy, Parker? At least according to you. The doctor inquired, his eyebrow raised in amazement that Naruto would donate his time in this manner. Yeah, I'll be fine. Naruto received a notification on his phone as he stated this. His pupils dilated, and he hastily excused himself. Any day that is not today, because I really need to go now. See you tomorrow. The child suddenly dashed out of the classroom, leaving Dr. Connors without a chance to answer. What a peculiar kid. Connors chuckled slightly to himself before resuming his investigation. Grief. Misery. Anguish. Loss. Failure. Hopelessness. A nameless child with a reddish, sepia-colored complexion and tight, curled hair peered down at the hundreds of people going by beneath him in the bustling streets of New York. He envied them, but he couldn't help but turn that envy into contempt for them. Those individuals didn't seem to care about him, he reasoned, nobody did. When he was being bullied at school, these same folks would stroll by without looking. When he lost his aunt, who was like a mother to him, none of these folks cared enough to sympathize with him. What was the aim of living? He was perplexed. Is there genuinely a goal? We live, die, and then. What happens next? Heaven? Hell? Reincarnation? Nothing? He was unconcerned. Whatever it was, it was far superior to anything this existence on earth could offer. The child drew closer to the brink, his toes dangling over the metal edge, pointing to his final goal. All he needed was one last push. He took a deep breath and began to gather the fortitude to take one last step toward his end. Goodbye. He murmured as he began to let his body fall forward, but his body was abruptly stopped by an unknown power. When he opened his eyes, he discovered a blue and black glove on his shoulder, when he turned around, he saw a spider's insignia in front of his face. When he looked up, he saw the masked visage of the spider hero. Sorry, I didn't get here sooner. The hero in blue and black replied quietly, drawing the youngster back and removing him from the brink. The hero couldn't think of anything else to say. He lacked the emotional understanding to deal with a scenario like this, but he knew he couldn't let the youngster fall. The child was perplexed, his attention drifting away from the hero. Why? 
He inquired. How come you didn't let me fall? I finally mustered the courage to do it, and you stopped me. These words silenced the black masked hero. They weren't grateful to him, they were angry and spiteful. What's your name? Inquired the hero of the young man. This certainly surprised the youngster. Usually, the heroes didn't care about the little guy. They were more concerned with greater issues such as universal beings or their playboy millionaire image. In reality, this was the boy's first close encounter with one. Hello, my name is Cameron. My friends call me Cam, he replied. Naruto returned the boy's name with a warm smile hidden beneath his mask. Good day, Cam. My name is Spider-Man, he said, extending his hand to offer the youngster a handshake, although this invitation was declined. Once again, the child was perplexed. Spider-Man, I assumed you were just the Phantom Spider in a different outfit or something. Spider-Man shook his head, slightly giggling. What the boy said was true, but it was also false. The Phantom Spider has vanished. I'm filling in for him. He did some bad things, so I'm coming to make amends. Oh. Cam muttered, his attention returning to the sidewalk hundreds of feet below. Why are you up here, Cam? Spider-Man inquired, half friendly, half stern. His mosque's lenses mirrored the anxious expression on his face beneath it. Isn't it self-evident? I really wanted to jump. The youngster reacted impatiently. But why? Spider-Man inquired once more. He knew the youngster wanted to jump, but he needed to know what drove him to do so. There are numerous reasons. My aunt, who had been caring for me since I was a baby, passed away. All of my classes are failing me. I'm feeling down. It doesn't help that I'm bullied for these things. They all make fun of my African middle name, making clicking sounds at me and claiming to be speaking my language. For a long time, music was my hidden passion, but they discovered it and now mock me for it. I've simply had enough. I'm a failure, my music stinks, and I'm by myself. Naruto could connect to a lot of what the youngster was going through. Being bullied, feeling alienated because of his skin color, and losing a mother figure. It was a lot to deal with at such a young age. I see. I understand how you feel, eh but. The hero tried his hardest to empathize with the youngster, but he couldn't get through to him, and the boy cut him off. No Spider-Man, you have no idea what I'm going through. Guys like you don't have to struggle a single day of their lives. Spider-Man remained motionless in the same location. He didn't know how he was going to persuade the boy that he actually understood him. Naruto, on the other hand, had an idea. He began raising his mask, presenting half of his young, somber, brown face to the youngster, demonstrating that they were more alike than he'd assumed. I actually do, he said quietly. I know how it feels to be bullied because of my appearance and to be an outsider. I understand how it feels to lose a mother. Cameron stood there with wide eyes and said nothing. It was the first time he'd seen a hero who resembled him. It was both surprising and soothing at the same time. I'm not qualified to assist you, Cam. I'm simply a child like you, and we may even attend the Samea school. The hero came to a halt. His mind raced at a million miles per hour as he attempted to talk, trying to come up with the perfect words. Cameron, despite his silence, was the one to speak. We went through the same things, but we aren't the same. Cameron expressed his regret. I'm just a boy, not a superman, he said to the hero as he sat on the ground, tears in his eyes. I'm unable to fight. I'm not good at shooting webs. I'm not able to fly. I am not a multi-billionaire. I'm only a kid. Spider-Man went down to the boy's level before speaking softly to him. This is not correct. I'm just a kid who likes to run quickly and climb walls. I, too, have my moments of weakness. I have vulnerable moments. I fail every day, and I cry at times. Being a Superman changes nothing. These aren't my true abilities. Spider-Man grasped the boy's shoulder and drew his attention to himself before pointing at his own head. My real powers are up here, Cam. The youngster then pointed to his chest, directly to his new spider insignia. I'm also here. This is true for both of us. Cam sniffled, saying nothing as he considered what Spider-Man had told him. Spider-Man continued to speak while soothing the boy. Do you make music? That is something I could never see doing. I'd like to hear it. But it's bad. The youngster said, brushing his tears away. As the boy behind the mask grinned and his lenses slowly relaxed, he looked up at the spider. No, it isn't. No music is awful, right? Except when it's country music. Spider-Man cracked a joke. For the first time, the boy chuckled, displaying a smile to the hero. Naruto felt relieved because this indicated that the youngster was becoming more at ease. No I want to be a film composer, so I write symphonic music. Orchestral music is on fire for me. Let's get this party started. I don't know. 
Cameron stated it hesitantly, he wondered if the hero, like everyone else, would make fun of him. Everything you undertake is fraught with danger, it is also dangerous to do nothing. Which risk will you take? That is what my teacher said to me. Don't be afraid to show the world what you've got, man. Spider-Man informed him, giving the youngster the final push he required. Cameron nodded, and the two sat next to one another as the boy took out his phone and inserted one earpiece into his right ear. He handed the other to Spider-Man, who removed his mask further to show a single ear and inserted the earpiece inside. At first, the boy was uneasy, casting a doubtful glance at the hero. Spider-Man gave a nod. Go on, he said, as the child began to play the tune. I haven't released this one yet, but it's my most recent one. Cameron expressed his trepidation. His inner voice hoped Spider-Man wouldn't be too tough on him. The music began gently, with heavenly yet sorrowful, high-pitched strings becoming louder. Those strings were accompanied by the faint sound of angels humming. Those high-pitched strings were quickly replaced with louder, booming, lower-pitched ones. These noises generated a bittersweet emotion, as if the person had endured loss while trying to remain positive throughout it all. As the low-pitched strings got more solemn, the sweetness disappeared, leaving only the bitterness. Soon, a mellow brass tone could be heard, like a pleasant breeze sweeping by the two listeners, and the boys began to feel hopeful, but just as they felt hopeful, the tone altered back to helplessness. Naruto was entranced. The music spoke to him in many ways, as if it were written specifically for him. There were sentiments of loss at first, followed by the sounds of the strings going through a long period of grieving. Every time the music started to feel hopeful, it quickly switched back to being depressing. It was downright dismal. During that long moment, all the hero could think of was his mother and what he did when she died. However, this changed when the final section of the song began to play. Soon after, the high-pitched, hopeful strings from the beginning reappeared, followed by the humming angels letting their voice be heard once again, rising louder as the two boys grew more hopeful by the second. Cameron's eyes brightened up once again as he saw a grin form on the hero's face and tears started to fall from one of his eyes. The music, despite its lack of lyrics, communicated directly to the young hero. Drums began to boom in the background shortly after, increasing in intensity with each collision as horns accompanied them. The drums shouted loudly, the exciting, heavenly voices sang, and the brass descanted out to them as each sound peaked, playing the same three notes, increasing in intensity with each repetition. The two lads felt like they could fly, soaring triumphantly across the skies as each instrument continued to communicate to them until everything came to a standstill. What an adventure, thought Spider-Man, no song had ever spoken to him like this before. That tune was telling a narrative, the story of a boy who lost everything and was on the verge of giving up. Through the anguish and adversity, that boy found his light and pushed through the darkness, emerging stronger than ever before. This was Cameron Elfman's story, Narudan Parker's story. Spider-Man is a legend. Humanity's parable. This wasn't just a song about the hero. No, it represented everyone, the citizens of New York, the underdogs. Cameron watched the hero continue to look forward with a smile on his face while the two lads sat there silently. What do you call that one? Naruto questioned, quietly smiling as he looked out at the cityscape in front of him. I didn't know what to call myself. I didn't grasp what I was attempting to say to myself when I penned the song. Thanks to you, Spider-Man, I now understand. The boys came to a halt. That's all there is to it. That's what I'm going to call it. Spider-Man, he spoke in hushed tones, is that okay? It's an honor. Stated Spider-Man, what about this? Let's put together a music video for this song. So, since there hasn't been any clear footage of my new costume yet, how about it? As a result, the two youngsters spent the rest of the day filming the hero swinging through the air while listening to the Spider-Man theme in the background. The video began slowly, with the hero swinging in the air as if looking for something, then transitioning to that of a confident hero, zipping through the air, past the camera, doing flips and spins as if he didn't have a care in the world. Finally, Spider-Man and Cameron found themselves standing next to each other. Spider-Man addressed the potential audience while holding the camera in one hand. He knew that once the tape was uploaded, the entire world would be watching, so he knew his message would be heard. Hello everyone, this is your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, and this is Cameron Elfman. I've never met a better songwriter, and we have a message for everyone out there. People are treated differently because of their appearance, how they talk, the type of music they like, how they dress, what they identify as, who they are attracted to, and the list goes on. I just want to say that if you treat others in ways that you wouldn't want to be treated because of who they choose to be, we don't fuck with you. 
If you have an issue with folks like us, I have an issue with you. That's all there is to it. Keep going to school, youngsters. Spider-Man turned off the camera and turned to face Cameron. That expression he had when he was ready to call it quits was evaporated. He'd found his calling. All he needed now was someone to listen. Thank you, Spider-Man, the youngster stated. No worries, and thank you so much, Cam. Sincerely, thank you. Today I learned a lot. Spider-Man told the child as he handed back his camera. Oh, there's one more thing. Do you have a pencil and a piece of paper? Yeah. The child answered as he began digging through his rucksack for the item demanded by the hero. He handed the hero his notebook and a pencil and began scribbling something down. This is my phone number. Call me if you ever feel depressed like you did today, and I'll come running. Even if all you want to do is say hello, I'll respond. All right, you're not by yourself. Cameron stated, got it. Thank you, again. As a result, the two split ways. Cameron stood there watching as the hero soared away into the cityscape, becoming little more than a speck in the distance. Cameron grinned, grateful for the hero. He was grateful that Spider-Man was there to prevent him from dying too soon. To be continued. A. That's it for this podcast. Thank you for listening to this video. I hope you did enjoy the part of the story. And if you did, like, share, and subscribe for more. And thank you all for helping support another great day.